Yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for uh, for having me. Uh, as Gene said, my name is Phil Gilbert. Uh, in thinking about uh, what I wanted to share with you all today, it occurred to me that uh, we have a relationship with AIGA that goes way back. We certainly have a relationship with some of the iconic designers who have been a member of this great organization. And so I started reflecting on how does that kind of history happen? And I feel like uh, this notion of open is really important to this concept. I want to talk a little bit about IBM and our approach to this notion of open because we've been around for well over a century and we've been having a conversation with humanity. We've been having a conversation about how humanity and technology interact with one another for well over a century. And it's my belief that the reason we've been able to do that so successfully and weather all sorts of storms, whether they are macro storms in the economy or whether they are storms that we're in the midst of right now in our industry that's causing all of us a lot of, a lot of turmoil. And I feel like what our founder said, that to understand IBM and our relationship with the world, you have to know a little bit about our past. A lot of you know about this, the PC. This is kind of one of the first kind of open things that IBM really did. We obviously are the inventors of commercial computing. When this thing came along, we had wildly optimistic projections that maybe 50,000 of these devices would sell in the world. The interesting thing about that is not that we were wildly wrong on the guesstimates of the impact of the personal computer, but the fact that we built it on open standards and regardless of whether our financial predictions, which oftentimes are not correct, regardless of whether our financial predictions are correct, we have a sincere belief that if we build on open, great things will happen in the world. When we got into software, we made a massive commitment to open source. Even today, we have a massive commitment to the open stack technologies that power our cloud data centers. In fact, three of the top 15 contributors to OpenStack just last week, it was announced, are IBMers. We are committed to open. This is probably not surprising to you, and it's probably not surprising to you that I started talking about computers and systems and what have you. That's only half of our story about open. I want to tell another story about IBM that you may not know, because I think it's fundamental to my mission, which is to create a sustainable culture of design at IBM. This culture notion tugs at me all the time. You've probably heard the, the notion that culture eats strategy for lunch every day, and it does. So let me tell you a little bit about IBM's open culture as we start to think about the application of design to IBM. In 1914, 76 years before the Americans for Disability Act, we hired our first disabled worker. 1935, we promised women equal pay for equal work. 1937, the first large Western organization to go into China and deal with a big part of humanity with an open conversation. Ruth Leach was our first female vice president, 1943. In 1953, Thomas Watson, Jr., then CEO, sent this letter to everybody at IBM. And it said, I want to restate our policy that every citizen of this country has an equal right to live and work in America. It's the policy of this organization to hire people who have the personality, the talent, and the background necessary to do the job. And in 1953, our first African-American executive, 13 years before the Civil Rights Act. In 1984, we restated our commitment to equal rights, and, we restate, and, and, and in our official policy, we, had, we formed official recognition for LGBT. We extended this in 2002 for gender expression. We've been at the forefront of open 
systemically and socially for over a century. I believe that diversity and openness is in fact our differentiation. It's why we're here. It's part of our DNA. And so if we are going to create a second century of leadership and greatness, how better to do that than to recommit ourselves to design as the basis for creating intentionally that culture. And so we're in the midst of this. We're actually at the fair beginning of this. You may have heard some of the numbers. We're hiring about 1,000 designers into IBM over about a five-year period starting January 1st of last year. We've added over 250 formally trained designers into IBM since then. It all builds on our past. And we have to look back again. When did we even start on this mission of design? 1956, Thomas Watson Jr. hires Elliot Noyes. Elliot Noyes brings a culture of design, calls himself the curator of corporate character, and by the way, was also the credited designer for one of the first iconic business products that the moment you saw it, every previous expression of that function went out of your head and you had to have it. Noise brings in Ray and Charles Eames, worked with IBM throughout the 1960s and 1970s, and brought their spirit into the most prosaic of devices. IBM is, in fact, a pretty fun place. We deal in the colors of the world. We deal in the world in all of its openness and all of its diversity. And we try to drive that sense of play into everything, even with ourselves. Today, our people are different, but we're the same. This is a picture of a, we call them campfires, this is a picture of one of our campfires in our new flagship 50,000 square foot Austin software design studio. It's one of the most amazing places to not only conceive and invent and design software products in a highly, radically collaborative environment, but we've also worked with Steelcase to develop a design language for a brand new way of thinking about the creation and destruction of space that we use to educate people, all of our people, in the practices of design thinking. We're hiring our people from the best universities and the best firms in the world. We've established relationships that IBM never had before at places like RISD and SCAD, School of Visual Arts here in New York, Pratt, Parsons. We're also working with a new ecosystem of design partners. We have a, a set of legacy design agencies that we've worked with, but we're also extending out now to places like the D School at Stanford, IDEO, smaller companies like IDEAN. This is a picture of our summer design camp. These are the 78 designers that started July 15th of this past year. And we put all of our new hire, university hire designers through a three-month design camp experience. This is them graduating from design camp when we went out to a place called The Thinkery in Austin. And this is them celebrating on their graduation night as they were getting ready to get their assignments for their full-time products going forward. Design Camp is a hugely innovative program that we're very proud of. We're creating a culture inside of IBM that might surprise you. It's a little bit irreverent. That's OK, too. We've created one of the, what is becoming, I think, one of the world's premier internship programs. 15 students per, year, per summer, per fall, and per spring. Devin O'Brien there in the lime, lime green shirt. Uh, Devin is a professor at SCAD that we hired to envision and now actually runs and recruits for our, for our internship program that we call Maelstrom. We love each other in IBM Design wherever we are. We've created great career paths for designers at IBM Design. This is a set of our design principles. At IBM, the highest single designation of craft is called IBM Fellow. In all of our history, there have been about 200 IBM Fellows. We have about 80 living IBM Fellows today. 
Uh, for the first time this year, we have a new corporate appointment career pathing that allows designers to achieve the designation of IBM Fellows. Other than engineers, it is the only profession so valued by IBM. This is a set of design principles, the people who have successfully completed the first step of that three-part journey. We've got great designers like Adam Cutler, who's the head of our studio programs, who's here, here today. Denise Burton, who was a fellow with Frog Design and became so inspired by our mission that Denise ended up coming to IBM to help us out. And I think a lot of you guys know Doug Powell, two-time past president of this group, and who just recently received a fellowship from the Minnesota chapter of AIGA. We are super proud of the designers today where we're carrying on the heritage of noise and Eames and Rand. Along with people, we've made a, new, a renewed dedication to space. And we've worked very hard to build studio environments that are engaging, not just for designers, but for everybody at IBM. And so this is a place where multidisciplinary team come. In, in this case, this is part of a new, uh, a new huddle system that was inspired by some work that the D School has done out at Stanford. And we worked with uh, uh, Steelcase to actually extend. Uh, this particular thing is now a product, has been productized by Steelcase. And although the first installation was in Austin, you can also find this type of, of studio environment at our newest flagship studio in Astor Place here in New York City. And each of our studios also have places of reflection. And this is also very important to the way that we practice. Our practices that we've built are probably our single biggest new contribution to the theory and the practices of design, because although all of us in this room and certainly all of the designers at IBM practice the fundamental principles, a lot of us have trouble when we start thinking about practicing at scale. I think a horrible meme that's gone out in the world is this notion of two pizza teams are the optimal size for innovation and execution. I categorically reject that, and I think it's a bad thing to be in the world. And it's a bad thing because it means that those of us who are put on larger teams have an excuse not to do our best work. The fact of the matter is I think what IBM can bring to the profession of design in a large way is how to scale these practices of empathy, iteration, prototyping, and understanding to very large teams solving very complex problems. We obviously have our basis as design thinking, and we've worked with some of the greatest design thinkers in the world to help craft our program. My own view is that design thinking is required not just for designers, but for everybody at IBM and baking it into our business platform because design thinking is the scientific method of the 21st century. In the 20th century, it was fine for science simply to explore and invent. In the 21st century, when for the first time ever, we have human beings being affected by technology at roughly equivalent rates everywhere in the world simultaneously, we have to have a mechanism that puts the human being at the forefront of that technological progression. Design thinking is the only method that will do that that is also based on the rigorous understanding and empathic relationships that we, that we nurture with these users. And so this is the basis for our practices at IBM, and we've buttressed them by, with a few concepts that we've labeled our own. And we call this specific variant of design thinking IBM design thinking. And it has three fundamental things, pillars, if you will, around the relatively understood practices of, of design thinking. Those are hills, which allow us to focus on big problems and align large, not geographically connected teams around them so that people can go off and execute on their own in an aligned fashion, even in very large teams. The second concept are sponsor users, a move away from cardboard cutout personas and a move toward the generative understanding, field-based, field research-based understanding of real people solving real problems in the real world with our tools. And finally, a notion of blame-free playbacks, 
that allow everybody coming together on a project to participate in its understanding of where it is in the, in the journey of its coming to being, and also in a blame-free way to provide everybody in the organization, not just designers, a safe place to, to give and receive criticism. These things form the basis of IBM design thinking. They talk about the experiences. One of the other things that we've tried to do in scale is the understanding of experiences. Every, all of us, all day long, we've talked about user experience, user experience. I mean, who would argue against user experience? But I struggled for a long time in my career. Well, what is a user experience? How can I, how can I scalably measure whether I've met a user experience? How can I communicate this to somebody? And so we've actually done some very interesting work around defining a framework of what we think are the six universal experiences that we are evaluating our own products, our own services, and indeed our own business against in our relationships with our clients and with the rest of the world. And you'll see that these experiences really are universal, and I think that this is a very interesting addition to this notion of designing for the human being. The first one is discover, try, and buy. This doesn't have to be for online software. When you walk into Walmart and try, Walmart and try to figure out what cold remedy to get, you're confronted with a dilemma. How should the product manager of one of those help you in your discover, try, and buy experience? It's a universal question. We all have to get started somewhere in everything that we do. What's the experience of getting started with your product or with your service or with your company? We talk, and if we major in anything at IBM, it's this notion of everyday use. How does your service, your product, how does it work for the everyday user? They've discovered it, they've tried it, maybe they've bought it, they've gotten through the first time to value, and now every day, does it reward them? We talk about manage and upgrade, and we measure every one of our products against this. We talk about leveraging and extending. We live in a world of mashups. Nothing, nothing endures. How do we bake in the notion of mashup into everything we deliver all the time? We are in a world that is increasingly heterogeneous. The platform that's interesting to me as a person selling IBM is not the platform that's interesting to you. Your platform is what my stuff has to fit in. We have to start thinking about that. And finally, we have to start integrating this notion of how we get support in a very real and organic and authentic way across everything that we do. So we've developed a language for collaboration. We call it IBM Design Thinking. We've developed a language for experience do we have anything else? I'm super happy to say today that today we're announcing the availability within the next two weeks of our new IBM design language, which will be available and accessible to all of you to take a look at how we drive our brand, how we drive the colors of the world, how we think about interaction, how we think about doing iconography, how we bake accessibility into all of our products will be available online for the world to use. And we encourage all of you to take it, hack it, extend it, give us your comments. We are super, super proud of this language. It's a language that attempts to unify everything that becomes, that is the, in fact the essence of IBM's brand. It's the ultimate expression of what Elliot Noyes tried to do when he talked about unity not uniformity across every experience somebody has with IBM, across all of our properties, across all types of properties, across our architecture, across our software. This design language attempts to unify this by focusing on these fundamental elements of typography, color, iconography, and user experience. And just to give you a little bit of a walkthrough of the website that'll be coming we start here, uh, we talk a little bit about the philosophy behind the language, the colors and our color palette and how we use them. 
We talk about how to surprise and delight people in their work applications. We talk about our own visual uh, methods. We give you an introduction to how we think about the visualization of enterprise-grade solutions. We also have our own designers talking about how they're hacking the language and how they're extending it. Miles has a great story about playing his own tune even within the guidelines of the IBM design language. I think one of the most interesting things we've done, IBM has a serious commitment to accessibility and to ensuring that all of humanity can engage with our software products and our services. We've baked accessibility directly into our language. There is no separate section about accessibility. Accessibility is no longer an other in our world. And so every aspect of our language actually has baked into, in this case, our visual langu language, has baked into it the communication so that the, so that the designer at the outset is just automatically thinking about these notions of accessibility. We do this as well when we talk about color. We talk about contrast, analogous examples, monochrom monochromatic examples, how they might appear in different products and still keep a unity across them, and how they might even appear in the same products. We've spent a lot of time thinking about the new iconography of what it means in business uh, to interact with an application. And so we, have, we are releasing our iconography guidelines. And in fact, by the end of Q1 next year, we will be releasing a, 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 an icon library that at the outset will have over 500 pre-built icons that I think is the ultimate expression from an icon standpoint of the preciseness of science and business with the fun and aesthetics of great design. We spend a lot of time thinking about interaction. And so there is a deep, deep section on the interactions that we expect from our products, our software products, as well as many of our hardware products. All of this is available for, for the, the world to see and make use of. We're also going to be releasing a robust set of tooling that all of you can download at no cost. We're working now with Monotype to get access to the fonts that we use at IBM. Downloading swatch books and color guides, interaction tools, as well as pre-built animations uh, and, and the CSS that will power those pre-built animations. All of these things coming together for us to create a better built IBM and for hopefully everybody around us in an open way to create better, more engaging applications for our business users. Applications like security applications, you know what they used to look like, this is what they look like now. Services for infrastructure, uh, infrastructure understanding, uh, threat, uh, threat uh, detection, in this case, business process management projects. In this case, I think this is a social media application and we're looking at uh, conversion rates on a marketing platform and here, one of our Smarter Planet, Smarter Cities applications. All of these things coming together in a suite of products that I think are the most beautiful and the most usable enterprise applications that have ever been built. Truly iconic examples of how we can bring these consumer expectations into even the very difficult dependencies that are created in a business environment. We are building an IBM and we're building a suite of products that I, I think begin to, to, to pay back on the debt that we owe noise and those others by releasing an IBM that has unity, not uniformity. Please follow us at IBM Design on Twitter and within the next couple of weeks you'll have a link to this wonderful, beautiful, iconic new language for enterprise application design. We think everything should be open. We're transparent about what we're doing. We're transparent about the people we're trying to hire and the talent that we're trying to nurture. We're transparent about the role of design in engaging humanity in a conversation whenever there's times of change. And right now, all of us are going through tremendous change because of the forces of mobile and cloud and social 
because of the demands of consumer grade design and because of the ubiquity of access planet wide, people aren't afraid of technology in the way they were with the, in the 60s and 70s when we used people like Ray and Charles and, and Jim Henson to help engage a scared populace. But today we have just as confused a set of constituents that we are designing for. We think an open conversation with that group is the only way to do it. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thanks, we'll have a seat. You bet. Great. Well, we have a few moments for, uh, for Q&A. So I, I know the question on my mind, but please <clears throat> go ahead and send, uh, send in your questions as well. The question on my mind is now, we've got thousands of designers yep. doing something what was happening before all those designers showed up, and what are all those new designers going to be doing that wasn't being done before? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know, we we recognize it's kind of interesting if you th if you think about uh, what's happened in the in the world of access, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we operate obviously at a global scale, um, but seven years ago, it was only seven years ago that the iPhone was released. That unleashed, that unleashed the combination of mobile and cloud and the whole set of social technologies that just got unleashed globally mm -hmm. and started affecting people planet-wide essentially simultaneously. It put a new set of design demands on the people we touch. Because our software and our hardware, uh, I don't know if you all know this, but the I IBM systems uh, something like 90% of the world's economic transactions flow over IBM systems. We literally power the economies of the world. You don't see it in your everyday life, but I will tell you that there's lots of users who do have to administer that. And so the demands because of this, because of this massive explosion of devices, the massive explosion of, uh, of signals because of these mobile and cloud technologies, and because of the social technologies, the massive number of people human beings that now had some touch point to that technology, it exploded overnight. And so we, uh, that, was, that was really the trigger. And so, uh, you know, obviously for, for a few years, we've been working on the programmatic aspects of this. We formalized it just about two years ago. Um, but it was really in response to an understanding that this was, a, this was as foundational a change, in my opinion, as uh, certainly the initial uh, thrust of technology in the 1960s. And we use design in the 60s to engage and help people through that. And we are now using design again to engage a conversation with people because everybody's in turmoil. Every business we sell to businesses, every business on the planet is in turmoil today because they're impacted by these things too. And so these designers, are they going to be uh, seconded to business teams? Are they going to be traveling with salespeople or visiting customers? As you think about what's the, I'm, I'm trying to think, how's the life of, a, of one of your new designers? What's it going to look like? Are they going to hang out in Austin in that cool looking new building all the time or be on the road? One thing I've learned at IBM is it's yes, 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 yes and yes. yes. And, and they are doing, we are doing all of those things. We have, uh, we have a group of designers here, and, and, and every one of them is experiencing every one of those things. A couple of them spend most of their time in Austin uh, work, work doing relatively, you know, what, what you would think. Uh, some of them have been out with our sales teams to do field research. We do a lot of user research. One of the most interesting things we brought into IBM as a part of this new program is a an emphasis on user research, generative field-based user research that has never been there before. That's, and, and that's one of the most transformative things that the, the business is seeing, is bringing back the real stories, not the anecdotes of what we heard yesterday or what somebody wanted to buy or this feature function, but the story-based understanding of real people is one of the most interesting things uh, that the business is starting to value uh, now. So they're doing all those things. They're, they're, they're traveling. We have a digital agency that's one of the largest in the world. Uh, those people are doing work for, for some of our largest clients, whether it's on uh, you know, digital properties or experiences. You know, IBM is the service designer behind Wimbledon, 
the US Open here in New York, the Masters in Augusta, that's IBM design. So uh, we, we have opportunities for all that stuff. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So in some ways, you talked about the, this incredible legacy of design that's part of uh, IBM that, that unfortunately probably most of us work for organizations that don't have that. There's no, there's no Eames or noise in our past. Right. But even having had that in your past, clear, IBM lost it for a while. I mean, up until recently in business school, we taught IBM as the, as the example of the company that lost it. Right. Right? We certainly and, had it. And, and then you had it, you lost it, but we're hoping that, I mean, there's something that you've gotten back. Absolutely. What was the trigger for that? I mean, uh, how do we help other organizations, even ones without that kind of history of design and the legacy of that, how do we, how do we help trigger a recognition of the kind that IBM has had that's right. led to your new role in building the business? Well, it, it, it's a great question, and, he, and here's the thing. Uh, all, as I said earlier, all companies today are facing the repercussions of this shift in platform. And it ultimately comes out in, in virtually every business I know is rethinking their customer experience in some way. That is, at a, at a tactical level, it's bringing design thinking into your customer experience initiative that is how it's done. Design thinking, the power of that becomes apparent, as we all know in this room. The, it is such a powerful approach to expose a company's executives to that, especially when thinking about the relationship that they want to have with their clients that today is fractured because their clients have these expectations that are off the charts because we've all got iPhones and iPads and, 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 and Androids. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that relationship, every business is trying to rethink. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, design thinking is the only way that you're actually going to solve that problem in today's world. Mm -hmm. Because there's too many technologies you can start with. There, there's too many inside out answers that you could have. But if you, if you put the user as your North Star, if you put your, your customer, that person using your service, wanting to talk to you, mm -hmm. uh, wanting to have a relationship, you know, hopefully wanting to buy something or uh, in, engage with you in some way. Um, if you put them as your North Star, you'll be all right. Mm -hmm. And there's only one approach that I know of that absolutely always starts with that person. And it's called design thinking. And it is the practice of design around a design thinking approach that will, that will literally transform that relationship, it will transform that user, it will transform that company. And I believe, as I said before, it will transform the world in the 21st century. Wow. We all agree with that, right? <laughs> all right. Uh, if you could just get the rest of IBM on board, we'll start there. Well, we're trying. You know, it's funny, uh, just the last thing, and I know we're out of time. Yeah, but, but we do have one great question that I, would, oh, okay. I do want to take a minute from, uh, from the audience, and, and maybe that positions this idea of the IBM design language. I think we all found it very interesting what, what's, uh, what's being announced and where you're headed with that. Yeah. Could you kind of quickly, of course, uh, where'd that fit in and how does that That's fit awesome. With this? So I, I'm, I'm so proud of this. We've been working on this for over a year. Uh, and in fact, uh, one of our star design, and dozens and dozens have worked on it, but Haley Hughes, who's here, Haley, stand up real quick and sit down. Uh, Haley is the star oh, of our okay. IBM design language. Stand up, there we uh, go. <laughs> We started this about a year ago, uh, but it really, and, and, and I'm not, uh, not to stay too much in the past, but it started with Eames. We, uh, when I took this role on, and I was very, uh, very much design thinking, bring design into the product, user first, all that. When I started really digging in uh, to IBM's heritage, I did not understand the vibrancy of our graphic brand. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't realize, I mean, I go to the airports and, you know, and, and you all have seen them and some of our Smarter City stuff, the Smarter Planet campaign, mm -hmm. these are awesome campaigns, but I actually didn't realize, it was one day when I realized the essence of our brand as a graphic statement mm -hmm. was 
a, there's no company on earth. When you read our branding manuals, you know, we talk to the people at Ogilvy we, and our marketing communications people, you begin to see the wonderfulness of this company in a way that you just don't when you look and use our products. And that was the, that was the trigger for me, and that's when it started. Mm -hmm. And so we kicked off an effort, Adam and, I, and myself and my, the rest of my team, and, and then Haley got involved uh, probably about nine months ago, and we really drove this. And, and the vision of this is how do we drive uh, to me, the, the colors of the earth, because we are operating at that scale, the colors of the earth are what informs the IBM brand. Mm -hmm. And I want to drive the colors of the earth into our products. And all of the richness and wonderfulness of nature, mm -hmm. in that sense, uh, translated into some useful form. Uh, if we do that with our language, for enterprise customers, I will tell you, enterprise uh, consumer people, I'm waiting for the day when somebody builds the iconic IBM design language based app. I'm waiting for the day somebody writes Apple and says, when are you guys going to start making consumer software that looks like this? <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds like a great note to end on. <laughs> With that, it's an objective. Awesome. Thank Gene, you for thank joining. you so much. Yeah. Great. Uh -huh. awesome. Thank you all.